25th anniversary of the National School Lunch Program, or NSLP. My name is Morgan McGee, Director of School Nutrition Leadership at Food Corps, the host for today's discussion. The National School Lunch Program is a pivotal program responsible for nourishing millions of children each year. As a former school nutrition operator, I have fond memories of the cafeteria, of the children entering with excitement to try the latest menu offering, or school nutrition professionals engaging and encouraging students to try new foods, and the joy on the students' faces when they actually did like the falafel or, or jicama. In a year of national recovery and a new political landscape, now is the time to talk about how food education can enrich this essential program and support students' social, emotional, and academic success. Momentarily, I will be introducing our panelists who represent a variety of expertise and perspectives. Then we will move into a moderated discussion where we will be taking questions from the audience. You can submit a question at any time during the discussion by commenting below or on Twitter directed at the at food court handle. Now, I would like to introduce our panel. Stacey Dean was appointed by President Biden to serve as the Deputy Undersecretary for USDA's Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Sciences Services, excuse me, where she works to advance the President's agenda on increasing nutrition assistance for struggling families and individuals, as well as tackling systemic racism and barriers to opportunity. Prior to joining President Biden's team at USDA, Dean served as a vice president for food assistance policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, or CBPP, where she also directed efforts to integrate the delivery of health and human services programs at the state and local levels. Welcome, Undersecretary Dean. Tim Barczak has more than 30 years of experience as an advocate. Tim is currently a senior policy analyst with the National Education Association, specializing in policy issues that pertain to education support professionals, including privatization. He has been an organizer, a union representative, a negotiator, a political director, a lobbyist, and a policy analyst. Great to have you, Tim. Next, let's welcome Arlethea Brown, the senior director of school nutrition for Camden City School District. Arlethea's career spans over 27 years of combined management experience in public education and school food service. She obtained a bachelor's degree in public administration and a master's in business administration and hospitality. Arlethea uses personal experiences and resources to serve the Camden community and broaden opportunities for children and families. Arlethea and the Camden School Nutrition Team have sponsored more than 10,000 underserved at-risk community students receiving remote learning. During the pandemic, their team has also provided access to meals with the transitioning of meal pickups to deliveries and bulk meals for families. Excited to hear your perspective, Arlethea. Thank you. Next, Kim Fortunato is Vice President of Community Affairs for the Campbell Soup Company, where she is also where she also serves as president of the Campbell Soup Foundation. She is responsible for Camden's community affairs strategy and program, including employee volunteerism. Kim joined the organization in 2010 to launch Campbell's Healthy Communities, a 10-year, $10 million initiative to improve the health of young people in Camden communities. As a program enters its 10th year, Kim, in collaboration with partners, are leading Campbell's new focus on transforming the school food environment. Welcome, Kim. And lastly, Indiwar Duda Gupta is co-executive director of the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality, or CGPI, where he leads work to develop and advance policy recommendations that alleviate poverty and inequality, advance racial and gender equity, and expand economic inclusion for all people in the United States. Prior to joining CGPI, Indy led strategic initiatives for major philanthropies, children's groups, and workers' organizations at Freeman Consulting, LLC. Before that role, he was senior policy advisor at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Happy to have you, Indy. Before we start the discussion, I asked each panelist to help ground the conversation and share a few thoughts on, what has been the greatest impact of the National School Lunch Program? Let's start with Undersecretary Dean. Oh, thanks so much, Morgan. I, I really appreciate being here. I appreciate your generous introduction. 
Um, and I can't wait to participate in the panel with such a fabulous group of people. Um, before we get started, I, I do want to just take a moment to say thank you to all of the folks who work in the school nutrition field who are joining us here today. I really uh, have been spending a lot of time over the past few months using this platform to express gratitude. Um, school food professionals put in extraordinarily long hours throughout the pandemic to find creative solutions to make sure that kids in their communities had access to healthy meals, um, despite the challenges of the pandemic. And I, I just, I can only imagine, um, I'm, I'm not sure I can imagine, but the what went into it and the extraordinary, um, extraordinary work that you all did. We've all heard stories about the heroic efforts of uh, school nutrition professionals and how they moved um, to swiftly uh, uh, pivot to grab and go, um, uh, meal delivery, uh, all the different options that they put out there because they were so uh, they, they were focused on their mission, which is feeding children. And that dedication is the heart of the school lunch program, everyone working together to feed kids. So on behalf of USDA, I just want to say thank you. Um, and it's just really a great pleasure to be here celebrating the 75th anniversary of the school lunch program. It's a pivotal program that in any given year helps tens of millions of children. Um, so thinking about its uh, long history and how many children, myself included, who have benefited from the program, uh, and how they how it's offered critical nutrition and opportunities for a brighter future. Um, school meals really are one of our most powerful tools for promoting health and ensuring nutrition security in children. Um, and as I said, reaching uh, to this year, 30 million children across the nation. Because of the pandemic, um, USDA has allowed schools across the country to serve meals to all children at no cost. But even prior to the pandemic, more than two thirds of participating children received meals at free or reduced prices. Um, uh, so opening up access to struggling, struggling households. And this isn't just important as a, a support uh, to struggling families, but the, it's the quality of the nutrition that the program provides. Tufts University recently put out a study in the Journal of a, um, Ameri JAMA uh, that found that school meals are their, uh, the healthiest meals that kids uh, receive. And in fact, one of the healthiest meal environments in the, in the country. Um, so we are doing our best to fuel our children with good nutrition um, because we know families count on the school lunch program to make sure that their kids are getting uh, the food they need to grow, learn, and thrive. So nothing, in my opinion, could be greater of a greater impact than providing a lifeline for vulnerable kids, uh, ensuring all kids, regardless of their background, are set up for success. So thanks for the opportunity to be here with you today, and I look forward to the conversation and the questions and want to hear from the other panelists. Thank you. Great. I love that. Next, we'll go to Tim. What has been the greatest impact of the National School Lunch Program? So I believe the greatest impact of the National School Lunch Program is contributing to the education of the whole child. Um, <clears throat> as educators, we are not presented with a disembodied brain in which we simply dump information. No, we educate whole, complete little human beings, children, who come to us with a, with varied and, and diverse needs that must be met if we were are to be successful in their education. At NEA, we like to say, in order for learning to take place, a child must be healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. And of course, feeding a hungry child is, is meeting the most fundamental of those needs. Uh, you know, you look at the challenge uh, that this program takes on. Uh, no Kid Hungry projects that 18 million children will face hunger this year. Uh, Northwestern University's Institute for Policy Research looked at the issue from a racial equity lens and uh, found that of Black households with children, 38% last year at this time were food insecure and of Hispanic households with children, 42% were. But with all that said, the greatest impact of, of the school lunch program is yet to come if we put some imagination behind our good intentions. So, you know, imagine school meals that are universal for every child without stigma. Imagine school meals that are fresh and locally sourced. 
Imagine a school nutrition uh, workforce that's given paid time and skills to work with fresh food and to do scratch cooking. Imagine a school nutrition workforce that is also given professional development in bully prevention, cultural competency, and student, student mentoring so that they're drawn closer to the rest of the education team. Imagine a school nutrition workforce that we can re recruit, recruit and retain because we compensate them fairly. And finally, imagine encouraging school districts to have self-operated lunch programs so that they can f facilitate all of the above uh, mentioned. So uh, thank you, Morgan. Love that, love that. You're speaking my language. Education, the whole child, embodiment, and imagining a future which doesn't currently exist. Next, we'll go to Arlethea. Arlethea, what has been the greatest impact of NSLP? Thank you, Morgan. First off, before I begin, I just want to take this opportunity to let you know how honored I am to you know, be on this panel with such great individuals and to be able to support my school district and the team that I serve and work alongside. The greatest impact of the National School Lunch is having the ability to provide resources to underserved communities that's been impacted with economic strains and social and economical barriers that exist solely due to some of those inequities and injustices that we've been fighting for all along, right? Every day when we serve our students, and especially right now through the pandemic, I think about the opportunities that I had as a young child, and I think about when we had the milkman coming through the neighborhood or we had the fisherman coming through with fresh fish and produce and cantaloupe and fruit. We didn't have a supermarket close by, but we had some of the resources that we needed. We had what we needed at a low cost. Here we are today living through a pandemic, which has taught us so much about resources and being resilient. The pandemic showed us insecurities in communities that we would have never thought that would have a need. While I ponder over the question and I consider the greatest impact of the National School Lunch, not only do I think about our children and our families with a direct impact, I think about the farmers. We're growing and selling produce and farming and producing milk and dairy products, serving our children school lunch drives supply and demand of some of our prominent sources and commodities and dairy, increasing the demand of our farmers and suppliers by driving economical demands for our country. The national school lunch impacts our health, wellness, social, an economical pulse while bridging the gap between food insecurities and increasing access to healthy meals. National School Lunch is just a way of life for me, and I am just happy to be a part of it. I love that, Arlethea. Wow, excellent. Next, we'll go to Kim. Kim, what has been the greatest impact of NSLP? Great, thank you, Morgan, and, and thanks to everybody on the panel, and especially Food Corps for hosting Food Corps. Is Many of you know has been a partner of Campbell Soup Companies and our, our Campbell's Healthy Communities for nine years now. So we're delighted to be going down this path and journey with you all. And a, a special shout out to my friend, my good friend and colleague, Arlethea Brown, who just spoke. Arlethea has been a partner with our work in Camden for many years, and we're really looking forward to continuing that partnership with Arlethea at the helm of School Food and Nutrition in Camden City School District. I think one of the greatest impacts is the time itself, 75 years. So we look at that 75 year period and the increased access we've enabled for so many children and in the past year plus to, to all children and what we've learned from the importance of the role of school food and nutrition for our kids and school lunches and breakfast and after school food. We know that nutrition plays such an important part, not only in their overall health, but also in their, their academic performance. We have lots of great data and research. And I think for us, for Campbell, as a private sector partner in this work, that evidence is very compelling. And I think compelling to my private sector colleagues uh, around the country that the investment in good health and nutrition for our children is paramount. And not only during the school day, but after school, and especially in the summer times when some of our less, um, less access accessible uh, meal programs um, really impact the students who might need those meals the most. So I think from a private sector standpoint, it's, it's, it's very important to us at Campbell 
And indeed, for the next five years, we're committing five million dollars to work on not only school food itself, but the entire school food environment. So speaking to our Lethia's point, we're looking at our local food system and increasing equitable sourcing uh, from our local farmers in and around the Camden, New Jersey area. We are looking at the overall school food environment during the school day. So not only what impacts our children and our students, but our staff, our families, our communities. And we're looking at how can we as a private sector partner help support school food infrastructure, procurement, leverage the expertise at Campbell Soup Company of our many employees who do this kind of work day in and day out to really create a strong public-private partnership that underscores the importance of what National School Lunch Program has done in the past 75 years and what we have to look forward to to create and imagine in the next 75. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kim. I think that's so and so important, right? We'll get into that a bit later about the environment, right? It's not just students going to a cafeteria or students going to a classroom, it's so much more. Um, and lastly, we'll go to Indy. Indy, what has been the greatest impact of the National School Lunch Program? Well, first, thank you, Morgan and, and Food Corps. Um, I'm delighted to join everyone. I'm Indy Dedegup at the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality. and. You know, I, I do want to uh, acknowledge that uh, this is important to me, certainly professionally, but also personally as someone who benefited throughout my childhood from the National School Lunch Program. I know that it was not only helpful in the sense of potentially saving my family money, but uh, it also saved time, uh, which I think is quite important for a lot of uh, families uh, who are facing a lot of stresses um, economically or otherwise. Um, to me, the most uh, really uh, the most important uh, effect of the National School Lunch Program is that it lifts people up in a way that advances equity and helps address two major longstanding inequities um, that certainly persist to this day, but those are uh, health inequities and racial inequities. Um, we know uh, that uh, the school lunch programs associated with lower food insecurity rates for households with children and you know, Kim and others have hinted at this, but um, uh, unfortunately a few things highlight that as well as what happens typically in the summer where food insecurity rates um, rise again. Um, and we know that uh, that in particular that, uh, you know, this is, uh, this comes from lower pr the lower prices of reduced price meals, but also especially the free free meals. Um, and we know that food insecurity itself is a major source of stress and can even harm uh, parent-child relationships. Um, but uh, as, um, as Stacy uh, Dean mentioned, that uh, we also know that the nutritional impacts are quite consequential here. So uh, the National School Lunch Program is associated with you know, kids eating healthier foods um, overall in their diet. Um, and uh, just generally uh, having better health, um, potentially even offsetting risks um, of being overweight or obese. Um, and uh, when you look at the, the racial data, you, you see that um, in schools where more than three quarters of students are eligible for free or reduced price meals um, as part of the National School Lunch Program, uh, nearly half are, are Latinx, nearly half are, are Black uh, students, um, and uh, overall, these are some of the same uh, populations that experience the highest rates of food insecurity. Um, and, and you see similar uh, uh, data when you look at um, smaller um, communities of color, but uh, Alaskan Natives, American Indians, and, and others as well. So, I mean, here you have a program that does exactly what great public policy should do. It, it improves uh, well-being, I think, unquestionably, and in doing so, uh, reduces what I think are um, unjustifiable, long-standing inequities, um, especially when it comes to race and health. Wow, excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you to each of the panelists for sharing their perspectives. I wanna dig into some of these issues right now with a few questions. As a reminder to the audience, we will be taking questions toward the end so you can submit yours via Facebook comments or at Food Corps on Twitter during any point of the event. All right, let's get started. The National School Lunch Program was born out of a national crisis following the Second World War and the Great Depression to meet the needs of families. As America emerges from the pandemic, 
What do you think will be the opportunities for school meals and our recovery? And we'll start with Undersecretary Dean. Um, thanks so much. So I think, you know, look, when the Biden administration uh, uh, came in in January, we were focused on the immediate crisis. Um, and so for me, that meant very much trying to address uh, food insecurity, particularly amongst uh, families with children and households of color. And so that was that was just basically what, what tools are at our disposal that we can leverage additional food assistance uh, to those who are getting it and to connect those who aren't getting it. And the school meals program and the pandemic EBT alternative has been an incredible platform for that. But as we look ahead, I re, you know, the president's mantra around build back better is definitely something that is top of mind for all of us in the administration as to how do we take what we've learned and move ahead. So I'm going to lay out, I think, some of the things about the way we want to do the work and just be advised. We don't, I don't know that we're going to land this to September of this year or even September of next year, but how are we thinking about strengthening such an incredible program? So one is we have to update the nutrition standards that um, uh, the school meals program operates under because we have a new set of dietary guidelines and we have to do that. So this is a great moment to step back, take collective learning from this broad environment and think about where do we set those standards so that we continue to push for good health uh, in a practical, uh, feasible way. Uh, the second is there's an incredibly vibrant peer community here. Uh, you've got uh, folks on this panel right here. And and how do we how do we take in information, take in learning, take in experience from uh, across this great uh, set of districts, 100,000 districts, and share um, and build out best practice. So I think that's a, a U USDA, I think, has often tried to do that, but in, but sometimes we push out and we receive in and we want to make sure we're supporting across. And Food Corps is an incredible, uh, or a, an example of an incredible organization that's doing just that. We have a lot to learn. I think another is what is our practice? How is our practices? What are we pushing? So local and sustainable. How do we support states and districts in doing more of that? Not just far through farm to school, which we want to expand, but through procurement, uh, climate friendly practices, those need to be a part of what we're doing. Equity, I, you heard earlier about how the food is sourced and who we're helping. And of course, uh, and you see this in our budget coverage, who are we making sure is covered by uh, the school meals program? And the administration put forward a proposal that would allow about half the districts and half the kids in the country who are unfortunately in high poverty schools or on our um, experience poverty themselves to be in a universal environment, which I think is would be a very powerful uh, down payment towards what for uh, longer term goals, as well as summer feeding coverage, we've got to address summer hunger. So I want to talk about the how we do it. And if we proceed on these kinds of pathways, I know we'll achieve great things. Excellent. Thank you so much. Next, we'll go to Indy. Indy, what does recovery look like? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question, Morgan, and uh, I'm honored to follow Deputy Undersecretary Dean. I, I do think the administration is uh, really uh, thinking ambitiously about this. Um, and, you know, we should keep in mind that a lot depends on what else happens, right? So the uh, recovery rebates or economic impact payments have been consequential. Unemployment benefits have been, of course, some states have cut back dramatically on them um, now. Uh, and we may have to offset some of the harm from the, those uh, decisions at the state level. Um, and uh, I do think that uh, Congress, especially to date through the American Rescue Plan, has uh, empowered uh, USDA with a lot of opportunities here. Um, we'd certainly love to uh, see uh, the uh, emergency relief um, that uh, USDA has to approve emergency assistance to, you know, SNAP families um, uh, utilize fully. We'd love to see uh, strengthening of some of the nutrition standards, um, as Deputy Undersecretary Dean mentioned. Um, and I think that uh, if their states could be supported in using waivers to serve more free meals, um, which it looks like uh, that's the direction that the administration is headed, um, including more opportunities potentially to expand community eligibility um, provisions. Uh, we would see a lot of progress in this pandemic, but we do have to be really uh, attentive to the fact that 
Um, we're going to see uneven effects uh, across uh, urban and rural areas. The recovery will be uneven. Uh, and as mentioned, we're already seeing states make some decisions that will um, assuredly, all other things being equal, uh, increase uh, hunger and food insecurity. Uh, and the administration may have to think uh, across agencies and departments um, to figure out how best to respond and, and mitigate those harms. Excellent, thank you for that perspective, Indy. And lastly, we'll go to Kim. Kim, what does recovery look like for school mills? Thank you, and, and, and to build on what my esteemed colleagues have been talking about, I think we have an amazing opportunity right now because the pandemic, if nothing else, really showed us in a very clear way how many of our systems need to be examined and need to be researched and probably rebuilt. And among those is our school food system. You know, I remember in March of 2020, calling Arlethea and getting together every emergency food service provider in Camden and some in Philadelphia to coordinate a call with them all weekly to say, who's doing what and where do we need help and where are their gaps and how can we coordinate? And you know that was a very early learning in the beginning of this pandemic of some of the systemic issues with our, our school food and delivery and, and certainly eye-opening to listen to our Lethia's stories about doing door-to-door, -door, not only grocery delivery, but pre-made uh, meal delivery as well. And we know that the pandemic has changed how we will feed our children and our families and our communities. So I think the opportunity is really to look at this with a systemic lens and say, where are there areas of opportunity for change and impactful change? Now, let's be clear, Campbell and the Kansas City School District and several NGO partners, including Food Corps, Common Market, Wellness in the Schools, National Farm to School Network, Alliance for a Healthier Generation, have been working on this pre-pandemic. So the work that we began two years ago in looking at school food and meal delivery during the school day and around the entire 12 month a year uh, was something that was on our collective radar as an area we wanted to make an investment uh, for the past 24 or more months. Again, with the pandemic, the urgency around the need for food security, healthy school food, healthy food throughout the school day and the, and the entire year is, is preeminent. So I, I think again, that the opportunity is really the urgency of now and the systems that need to be updated, revised, refined, so we can ensure that all of our children have healthy school food and nutrition before the school day, during the school day, after the school day, throughout the weekend and throughout the year. Urgency of now, excellent. So during the pandemic, schools served as critical hubs for families and communities, often providing much needed services. How can we best support schools in the upcoming school year? And is it through school nutrition? And we'll start with Arlethea. Thank you, Morgan. Um, first off, uh, Kim shared that we have had some unique struggles through the pandemic and the ability to come together as a group of individuals with the Camden Food Collective helped make things a very just much easier for us. And I do want to thank Campbell's Food Foundation and our Camden Food Collective for helping me through those trying times. We learned how to adjust through the pandemic. We went from behind a line or from being out of a classroom to serving pre-packed meals, to meal prep, to individual meals for students, to bulk meals for families, to multiple days of pickups for weekly, to delivering seven days of meals to what we call a grocery models, which is bulk meals delivered to doorsteps. I urge everyone to support and work with the school lunch programs. I urge families to utilize their resources. Unused resources diminishes after a while. We need to understand that. We need to continue with turning waivers into long-term policies and building upon on the momentum and continuing with access to meals with a continuation of meals served from not just five days to seven days a week. Prior to the pandemic, we incorporated a brunch program here in the city of Camden with our schools where we had the opportunity for parents and students to come together. 
We need to have meals served seven days a week, breakfast, lunch, dinner. So we need to change our policies to reflect that. It's very important. We made adjustments to our operations in order to increase participation. How can we best support schools in the upcoming school year? Participation is first and foremost. First and foremost, we must expand access to meals by increasing waiver opportunities and allowing after school dinner and snack meals to exist without curriculum based programs. Maintaining waivers by allowing access to meals for every child, no matter the circumstance, increase equipment opportunities and share out best practices because change is relevant. Increase training and development to help our school operations and allow for additional funding opportunities to expand operation and provide opportunities to support the needs of a school district. We need to begin bridging the gaps between education and school food. One, you can't have one without the other. We have to treat the whole child. So they're the ideas that I have as we move forward. And uh, I, again, thank Kim and the Camden Food Collective for all the work that you've done prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic, and I couldn't have done it without you. It takes more than just a school food or philanthropic or foundation. It takes the entire school village. That means the superintendent. That means the teachers. That means the school leaders. That means our security officers. That means our parents in our corner stores. That means bringing everyone to the table. Thank you. Oh, Arlethe, it's going to be tough for anyone to follow that. You gave me the chills. Um, we'll we'll uh, turn it over to Tim. Tim, what do you think are the, the upcoming opportunities for this school year? Yes, uh, Arlethe is a hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> I think we, um, for one thing, uh, on, on just very uh, uh, simple matter, we need to make sure that school districts are aware and taking full advantage of all the federal funds uh, that are available to help them stabilize their budgets. But beyond that, I, I think we should work uh, to form uh, coalitions with school districts um, to advocate for a school nutrition system that can withstand the next crisis, uh, I, you know, not, not at all being doom and gloom, but we live in an age of of coming pandemics and with climate change, um, there are going to be other. Uh, there's going to be another crisis down the road, and we don't need to constantly constantly be working within a system that has to patch itself together uh, during a crisis. Uh, we should build a sustain a sustainable uh, school nutrition system, and that includes a lot of the things that. Um, Arlethea mentioned, particularly universal school meals. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Next, we'll go to Undersecretary Dean. How can we support schools this fall? Um, well, thanks. So, and Indy, who I've known for 15 years, you can call me Stacy. So, <laughs> sorry. Try to catch myself. I, it's there. still me. I'm just. I'm in. I'm Try still in my me. friend hall closet here. <laughs> like it's. It's all very. Uh, all of this is very humble. <laughs> anyway, um, so I think one of the things that is most I think important for all of us to understand is that even as the economy um, takes off, that typically when we experience a recovery. Uh, the improvements in poverty uh, and improvements in wages and earnings amongst very low-income households can lag quite a bit behind. So uh, we, we should expect to see many communities and individuals continuing to struggle. Um, and so that's, uh, so one thing is to just make sure that our safety net is there across the board, but in the, sp in the school meal space, that's one of the reasons why, because we knew we were entering an uncertain fall. We knew that the school meals program had been stressed extraordinarily over the past, uh, well, since last March, we wanted to offer a, um, flexibility. So uh, that's why there are waivers so that schools can offer all meals universally free. They can do it under a slightly um, more relaxed reimbursement rate. And uh, there's, uh, there's a couple of waivers available to help them deal with what are likely to be 
uh, unpredictable circumstances and school meal environments in elementary and middle and high school that all could be quite different. So we wanna, so th that's one thing is to just support the institutions and the, and the people that they serve with what they're gonna need as we grow, right? This, this isn't gonna be a flip a switch and everything's okay. But in that space, we have an enormous amount to learn about what will happen when we are in a universal environment, when there is a, a slightly higher reimbursement rate, although knowing that costs will be higher and um, there will be I'm sure unforeseen challenging for circumstances ahead. But this could be a year where districts have, if they have the bandwidth, a little bit more capacity to experiment, um, a little bit more to, to either procuring locally or trying things a little bit differently and seeing what happens. And I hope that I hope that they can and I hope that we all work together to learn from that. Um, and we certainly want to lean in on supporting expanding that community eligibility option, uh, both legislative, but, but our options administratively as well, so that when we come out on the other side, uh, more, more schools and districts are serving universally free. And, you know, we want to make sure that we see the American Families Plan enacted as well as the jobs plan, but in the families plan so that we have coverage for summer feeding and so that we can extend a universal environment to more high poverty schools. So I think it's going to be a really unique year because um, things will be operating so much differently, but yet what an incredible uh, experimental uh, opportunity so that we can learn even more for the future. Exactly. Excellent perspective. And lastly, we'll go to Kim. Kim, how can we best support schools in the upcoming school year? And is it through school nutrition? Well, uh, let me tell you how we're going to support specifically the Camden City School District and then um, on to some of the other districts in our Campbell footprint. But primarily our focus starting now and really has been uh, is on the Camden City School District. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we'll be committing a million dollars in funding to support Arlethea and her work. But let me tell you how we're going to do that because it's not simply a, a corporate funder writing a check. It is a group of us, as, as Arlethea mentioned, the Camden School Food Collective, uh, which we're loosely called at the moment. Uh, but we've come together as a collective. And while Campbell is the funder of this collective and the very early stage backbone, uh, my, my good friends and colleagues from Food Corps will be taking on the backbone role of this work. Our program goal for this collective is to foster a school nutrition environment that ensures all students are well nourished and ready to thrive at school and in life. Now, all members of this collective, who include the district, school foods, current school food service provider, Aramark, and the organizations I mentioned a few minutes ago, Wellness in the Schools, Food Corps, National Farm to School Network, Common Market, our, our local food bank of South Jersey, who does all of our nutrition education, and the Alliance for Healthier Generation are all committed to that common agenda. We will have common metrics that we measure against all of the strategies and all of the inputs that all of these partners are doing. Our focus areas for this collective are a school nutrition mindset, we really are committed to creating a mindset across every level within the district of the importance and the priority of access to healthy school food, nutrition education, and an expanded meal program that creates nutritious meals for children, as I said before, during school, after school, and as Arlethea said, seven days a week. Second pillar is food service infrastructure. How can we help support the district to provide the best infrastructure, newer equipment, any needs that they may have. And, you know, as a food company, uh, we have lots of intel on equipment and infrastructure needs, as well as procurement. Thirdly, nutrition education. And when we think of nutrition education, you know, we've been doing work in Camden with a handful of schools for a decade, and nutrition education was one of our primary strategies in our Healthy Communities program. Uh, we work with the Food Bank of South Jersey to implement Cooking Matters. And this is nutrition education, not only for the students, but for our families and community cooking classes. And indeed, pre-pandemic, we brought fourth grade students into our Campbell Consumer Test Kitchens for six weeks of nutrition education uh, in the test kitchens with our employees, with our food bank staff. Uh, so learning so much more than culinary skills. And then lastly, procurement and menu change. And this is when we really start to look at our local food system and equity issues within that food system. And how can we support a, our local farmers, our local growers 
to have access to more fresh fruits and produce, but also support our, um, our minority farmers in the, a 250 mile radius up within our food system. So those four pillars, we are all as a collective committed to. We have KPIs against each one. And Campbell, again, as a private sector partner, I think is much more than a partner and a corporate funder, but really all in, in making the changes that are necessary to see everybody thrive in a healthy school food environment. Great, I love that. Nourished and ready to thrive and you're all in. All right, so our next question. Food justice and racial justice are intersectional, simply meaning you can't address one without the other. They are interdependent. With the new administration committed to addressing systemic racism and racial disparities, how can we advance racial equity through school meals and food education? And first we'll go to Arlethea. Thank you, Morgan. That is such a good question. I've been pondering and pondering and pondering about school meals and food education. And it takes me back to the work that we're doing with the Camden Food Collective. And it took me to a TV show that I just watched this week, High on the Hog. I'm not sure if anyone else has seen, has seen it, but it is phenomenal. I loved High on the Hog. I've also had an opportunity to speak to meet a phenomenal woman, Liz Wills Ogilvie, and she helped me to bring some things to fruition that I've been working through over the past year through the pandemic. I've been, for whatever reason, been seeking and trying to learn more about my ancestors and where I come from, what I'm doing and why I'm doing this work, right? And so what I've learned is I need to understand my history. That's how we start building upon edu education, food education and learning and bridging the gap between racial inequities and school meals and food education. We need to have an understanding of our history. Where does food come from? How does it grow? What does it do for us? What are those healthier options for students and families? We have to begin uh, understanding our culinary fields. We need to push forward, uh, bringing Department of Education and Department of Agriculture to come together, bridging those gaps, bringing them together as one versus two separate entities. We need to start teaching our children more about food and where it comes from, how it's grown, what it's going to do to us. And we have to start doing that now. At some point, guess what? We are all going to have to start growing. And when we heard earlier about the pandemic and what we're going to do for the future, we need to understand that there may not be a supermarket or a store that we can go to to get food. That means that we may need to start growing our own food and learning more about farming and agriculture. So for me, how can we advance racial inequity through school meals and food education, teach our children more about where food come from, comes from, how it's grown and what we can do with it? As I love High on the Hog, the work that's being done and getting back to our roots and knowing where our food comes from, right? From food education and the work that's being done in schools. Next, we'll go to Indy. Yeah, the, those are great ideas, uh, Arlethea. And I, I, I will add to it by thinking about, of course, we have to ask how we can, uh, what the new administration can do to address systemic racism and, and racial disparities when it comes to the children and families served. But I want to emphasize that we also should think about how these programs um, can affect uh, job quality for the workers. Um, who are involved and the, uh, and even potentially affect entrepreneurship, um, including among um, black and brown entrepreneurs, depending on the contracting and other efforts. So we should think quite expansively about the tools here. Um, and I think, um, you know, when it comes to the children and families, as we know, uh, we not only saw higher rates of uh, financial insecurity during the pandemic among Black and Latinx families, but gaps also uh, widened uh, relative to white families uh, at, at, by various measures at many points during the pandemic. Um, and uh, again, it's it's far from over, you know, despite the progress we've made. So uh, we're going to uh, likely see some of these gaps persist uh, significantly. Um, and then the health challenges as well um, are deeply interrelated. 
uh, here with the National School Lunch Program and generally with food and nutrition. So I think uh, we should really think hard about what can be done about uh, nutrition standards uh, that can disproportionately help improve the uh, health of uh, especially black and, and rural communities as well. Um, and as, as Stacy, Deputy Undersecretary uh, Dean uh, mentioned earlier, thinking about expanding community eligibility provisions and uh, ensuring that higher poverty areas um, don't, uh, they can more easily and seamlessly provide universal uh, meals. And uh, I think that will also take seriously the, the paperwork, the administrative burden that a lot of folks may face um, and potentially reduce stigma as well. Um, and we need to think a lot about uh, that too. When we, um, Arlethia especially talked about how it sort of takes the entire uh, village, um, when, it, when the entire village is involved and can participate, I think uh, it can sort of change how people see the program. And that could be uh, helpful uh, in the long run, um, as well as immediately um, reducing stigma. So there's a lot that the administration uh, can do. Um, they'd certainly benefit from additional statutory change, but uh, uh, it looks like they have uh, a, a great, a strong agenda for advancing food justice. And I hope um, it certainly starts with the children and uh, their families, but it extends to the uh, quality of the jobs, uh, the working conditions of the workers, and uh, even to contracts as well to really promote um, addressing systemic racism throughout the food system. Great, thank you, Indy. And as you mentioned, it's a it's a systemic issue, as we all know, right? So it doesn't just take one approach; it must be systemic. Next, we'll go to Tim. Tim, how can we advance racial equity through school meals and food education? Yeah, thanks, uh, Morgan. Uh, great comments by uh, Indian uh, uh, Indian Arlethia. Uh, wanted to give a particular uh, shout out to uh, Arlethia for mentioning uh, food sovereignty, which is uh, an issue I think as advocates that we're we're overlooking in too many uh, situations, overlooking an opportunity there. Um, so, uh, in addition to everything that was already said, I uh, want to point out that. There's also a, a, an issue of uh, food quality. Um, Black, uh, Latinx, and indigenous and, and indigenous communities are two to four times less likely to have access to fresh and healthy foods uh, than white communities. Um, with that said, and with everything else uh, already said, um, you know, I think it. Uh, we need to, to, to get across this idea that school nutrition programs are not just th this annoying thing that schools have to do, uh, you know, before they can, can uh, go to classroom instruction. School nutrition programs have become essential hubs of nutrition for the for many American families, particularly uh, American families of of color. So, uh, you know, we can advance uh, racial equity and in, in in part uh, by drilling home that idea uh, with decision makers and advocating. Thank you, Tim. And lastly, to Undersecretary, uh, Undersecretary Dean, excuse me. Um, thanks so much, Morgan. So I think this question got harder after, you know, you talked about these issues in, as intersectional and then every speaker layered on more ways that all of this is built into the system. It's part of the the soup that there's, we're swimming in at this point, right? And um, so <laughs> I, I guess I would just say, look, this is a this this is a f fundamental to how the Biden administration wants to be um, uh, governing, right? We want we have to um, uh, incorporate equity into everything we're doing and think systemically. So just a couple, just even today, USDA uh, put out a, an announcement. I'm just looking over here on my other screen for a quote on it. Through this initiative, USDA will help to ensure the food, the food system of the future is fair, competitive, distributed, 
and resilient, supports health with access to healthy, affordable food, ensures growers and workers receive a greater share of the food dollar, and advances equity as well as climate resilience and mitigation. So like that's <laughs> that's a huge set of goals with respect to this one particular uh, set of initiatives we have um, where you know basically the secretary has charged us with transforming the food system. So it will be, uh, perhaps we won't pull that off in a month or two, but uh, that's the goal of where we wanna go. And I just think, look, when we think about how to do this work, uh, we should obviously take small actionable change where possible, but it is important to think about how the pieces fit together. I think Indy was, um, exactly right. As uh, earlier on in the conversation, and just now, um, what if if we increase the minimum wage? If we have paid family leave? If we are uh, supporting childcare workers with uh, an appropriate wage and training, right? Um, uh, uh, we we make critical important investments to uh, pay folks and and uh, make sure that their employment is responsive to life. Uh, it also means that they may not find themselves in a situation where um, they are food insecure. And so, you know, it, you might not think that an investment in a minimum wage or paid family leave is about food insecurity, but it absolutely is. And so, I think we see how these pieces fit together. And an example of one is uh, right now we are reevaluating the basis for SNAP's benefit. SNAP's benefit is based on this food plan that the USDA estimates call, estimates called the Thrifty Food Plan. And it's there's long been criticized as being unrealistic uh, for what it actually costs to buy a healthy basic diet. And so we're taking a look at that. And I don't actually know where we'll land, but assuming we land in a place that increases the benefit, um, that that's important for everyone's health, but it will have enormous important equity impacts. And it means that we will ha be having a more honest conversation with participants about, you know, here's a SNAP benefit. And with this, you can access a healthy diet. Has that really been an honest exchange up until now, right, uh, relative to where we might be able to go with it in the future? So that's not really a direct answer to your question, but I feel like uh, these issues are sort of all around us and we've got to think about tackling it. We've got to think very big. Um, so er I loved everything I heard from the other panelists. And um, and I, I think the other thing is we also have USDA has to listen. So I really do hope that folks are engaging either with me or with your regional offices. Uh, actually, several people on my team said well, they really hope the Food Corps folks are know their regional offices and are sharing what they're learning because we've also got to approach a lot of this with humility. Um, the way we have been doing things is what got us here. So got to think about uh, maybe listening to a lot of different voices, stepping back and trying different new approaches. Excellent. And I think to your point, you describe intersectionality, right? It's not just, yeah, it might be minimum wage, but it actually does affect this. It actually does affect that, right? And so that's that's what we're getting at uh, in this conversation. All right. So uh, before we get to our last question, I just want to remind the audience that we will be taking questions soon. So please submit if you have one below on Facebook or on the at Twitter, excuse me, at Food Corps handle on Twitter. All right, our last question. The Senate Agriculture Committee has confirmed that we will prioritize or that they will prioritize child nutrition reauthorization or CNR this year. CNR is a process when Congress scrutinizes and updates laws that govern all child nutrition programs, including the National School Lunch Program. It has been more than 10 years since the last CNR. What opportunities does CNR bring to further strengthen connections between local farms, school gardens, classrooms, and the school cafeteria? And we'll first go to Kim. Great, thank you. And uh, I hope, before I answer the question, that I hope, um, Arletha, you'll join me in welcoming not only Undersecretary Stacey Dean, but also our fellow panelists to come to Camden to see the work that we're collectively doing in this public-private partnership. Uh, and, and that brings me to answer this question, is that, again, what an opportunity we have to re-examine, to redesign, to rebuild. And if we don't take advantage of this time, then shame on us. Uh, there are so many good, strong, programmatic partners in this country doing remarkable work around farm to school, around school gardens. I think of the work we've done with our food course service members in many areas of this country over the past decade. It's phenomenal work. 
we are we're creating an experiment in Camden with our Lethea's leadership and her help and with this collective. And what we're hoping to do is to create a blueprint for any school district to use and to really lift up the leadership and the importance of the school food service nutrition team and their leadership and uh, and every support around it. And we're very intentionally doing a lot of funding uh, with our not only our foundation funding, but with our corporate funding as well to support the strong programmatic partners in the field, bring them together, work collectively to really push toward our common agenda to make a change and to demonstrate at a very site specific place in a city that has lots of challenges uh, that we can do this, that we can make an exceptional school food environment, a best in class school food environment led by a great leader and supporting that leader with the different support systems that she needs to have success for her entire district. So we're really hoping that this is an experiment that yields great results and um, replicability overall. So the time is now for action and we can't waste that time. Excellent, we, we definitely cannot waste it. Arlethea. What opportunities does CNR bring to further strengthen connections between local farms, school gardens, classrooms, and the school cafeteria? Morgan, thank you. I'm not sure how I can follow Kim. Um, I think that she, you know, said a mouthful, and she is absolutely 1,000% correct. And I do invite all of the members of this panel to join us in our Camden Food Collective here. And uh, Secretary Stacy, you said think very big. Yes. We have to think very big and we have to take full advantage of the resources that are available to us and the time and the folks that's been doing this work. There are organizations out there like Healthier Generation, Alliance for Healthier Generation, Food Corps, South Jersey Food Bank. There are organizations, wellness in the schools that's out here doing the work. They know what's needed. They've been partnering with me through the entire pandemic. And we've made the changes that we needed to make to make sure that our students and our families have access to meals. And what opportunities does CNR bring to further strengthen connections between local farms and school gardens. Local farms and school gardens is an absolute must and should be part of the, the curriculum that students have. Students should have a school garden at every school. They need to learn more about agriculture. They need to learn more about the food that they're eating. And school cafeterias, we're not just here making sandwiches or putting chicken nuggets in the oven. We're making salads. We're providing good, nutritious, healthy meal options. We're partnering with folks like our friends over at American Dairy to not only just serve milk, but serve smoothies, fruit smoothies, things like that. We should be teaching our school food teams and our cafeterias how to create great meals for our students to help uh, provide nutrition and wellness for our communities. CNR has a big, big taken. They must make change and it is huge. That means that our policies need to change to incorporate education and Department of Agriculture through school food and uh, breakfast programs and lunch and dinner programs seven days a week. I expect to see all of our waivers turning into policies. If you don't, if the pandemic didn't do anything, it taught us what we need to do as we move forward, as we begin to grow, as we begin to change. Change is paramount. It's definitely necessary. And the laws that we had are in the past. We need to make some adjustments to make sure that we have a full understanding of the difference between equity and the difference between equality and justice and injustice. When I think about racial disparities and I think about the advancement of racial equity through school meals and food education and the opportunities that CNR must bring to strengthen connections between our farms and our gardens, classroom, and cafeterias, that means curriculum changes, that means policy changes, and that means, what did you say, Stacy? Think big, and that's what we need to do. Think big, no no little thinking post-pandemic. We are, we're done with that. We're only thinking big into the future. Excellent, next we'll go to Tim. Tim, what opportunities does CNR provide? 
Thanks, Morgan. Uh, well, we are still hopeful and optimistic about uh, getting universal uh, school meals uh, in, in that package. Um, you know, if you think about it, by the time the current waiver expires, we'll have had over uh, two years of, of this very uh, useful support uh, for kids and their families. And we don't want to see the rug pulled out from underneath the kids who barely qualify uh, uh, for reduced price meals or, or who, who don't qualify or those who do qualify but don't participate either because of the stigma or because of parents or guardians who who uh, uh, you know don't understand the, 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 the paperwork required etc um, so you know we're hoping that that you know policymakers don't ask families to go back to hunger and debt and we're also asking uh, that you don't ask our members, the school nutrition workers, to take food away from kids. I mean, remember, it's those um, frontline school nutrition workers who have to uh, have to tell the child, oh, oh sorry, uh, you know, <laughs> you have to have the peanut butter sandwich instead of the hot meal. So uh, we're still hopeful for, for universal uh, meals in this package. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Tim, for that perspective. And lastly, we'll go to Indy. Indy, what opportunities are available with CNR? Yeah, thanks, Morgan. Um, you know, I, I often tell people that there's no silver bullet to uh, addressing inequity because inequities are everywhere. They permeate uh, virtually every aspect of our lives, our systems, um, our institutions. And so that means there's opportunities everywhere too. Um, so that means that there are real opportunities here, not only for uh, you know, improving nutrition, health, and education outcomes um, for uh, kids uh, from working class families, uh, kids of color as well. Um, and, you know, we can do that through increasing reimbursement levels and um, uh, also by, you know, focusing on local foods and promoting healthier uh, uh, meals through, through that uh, approach. And, um, uh, we can also think about um, supporting marginalized food producers. Um, you've got, uh, when you look at sort of the data on farm ownership, um, a, a tiny fraction uh, of farms uh, today are um, uh, owned in particular by people of color. Farmers, regardless of race, are often um, struggling um, considerably under a lot of the pressures and volatility they face. Uh, Stacy mentioned uh, that their agenda even includes addressing um, climate change, uh, which makes all the sense in the world. The food system has uh, got to play a major role there. And you can see the obvious uh, connections there with uh, the potential benefits to uh, kids um, who are marginalized in some form or another because of their race, income, where they live, um, since climate change assuredly will harm them the most as well. Um, and of course, um, we should think hard about the, the sort of frontline workers as Tim was talking about. So there are a lot of opportunities here. And, and you know, what this is once every 10 years, uh, it feels like um, the child nutrition reauthorization, I have every uh, bit of confidence that uh, the undersecretary and the Biden administration will take advantage of the opportunity. Um, but I also wanna underscore um, what was mentioned earlier um, about updating SNAP uh, standards and the sort of meal plan that SNAP benefits are based on. This could be enormously consequential. This is once in every, you know, couple generations uh, sort of opportunity. And, you know, we should have all of our meals reflect reality. It should reflect the reality of cost, the reality of what people actually eat. Um, it should reflect the reality of science, the best uh, available science um, on what is healthy uh, for children. And, um, I think we can we can get all that uh, closer to right than we ever have in the past. So I'm I'm very optimistic about the child nutri child nutrition reauthorization coming up. Thank you, Indy. And you know, as a as a SNAP ed educator in my early days working in schools, I can tell you an update to those nutrition standards for folks uh, based on the reality is something that a lot of folks I know would would benefit from. Um, thank you all for such a lively conversation. You know, when I hear words like intersectionality, systemic change, food sovereignty in relation to school meals and food education, this is a conversation I'm, I'm honored to be a part of and I appreciate your perspectives today.
We will now transition to audience Q&A. Please feel free to submit questions via Facebook or Twitter. We're also live streaming on LinkedIn. Our first question, uh, which is a two-part question, comes from another friend of Food Corps, uh, Dan Elnor uh, in Kentucky, from LinkedIn. And it says, how can we not just reauthorize school lunch, but reimagine it? School lunch has not fundamentally changed in decades. And how do we incorporate school lunch operations just like we do roofs and decks and computers uh, into schools, right? Um, and, and not just have them tied to the point of sale. So let's not forget uh, the second part of school meal programs, which fall under the farm bill. So we'll we'll just start with the first piece there. What do you all think about uh, reimagining school lunch and your wildest dreams? What does that mean? If we had no guardrails, if we had no uh, you know separation from the lunch day, what what would that look like? And um, maybe we'll we'll see what Arlethea's wildest dreams are. <laughs> I know I know they're big, Arlethea. I'm sorry. So you're absolutely correct. I do have so many dreams. Um, but first off, I do see executive chefs in every school cafeteria. I see our chefs uh, creating great food, restaurant quality food across every school district in every school community. I see that. I see that because we're trying it out here in Camden. Um, we may not have an executive chef in every school, which I wish we did. We have chefs in some of our uh, full prep kitchens. And so with the help of the Camden Food Collective and the foundation um, through Campbell's and Kim um, and a healthier uh, Alliance for Healthier Generation and Food Corps, we're going to start um, redeveloping um, and training our staff so that they can provide that high quality food that our students so deserve. We started out with our brunch program, as I mentioned earlier, where we had our chefs come in on a Saturday morning um, doing fresh pancakes and um, wa fresh waffles and uh, French toast with a full of uh, fresh fruit and vegetable salad bar where they had omelet stations so that our parents wouldn't have to take a Saturday morning, try to create breakfast and hurry up and clean up. They can actually sit down with their child on a Saturday in a school setting, receive a full breakfast and the children, they didn't have to worry about paying because we utilize the resources that were available to us through our school nutrition and our child and adult care food program. So I imagine school, reimagining school food with executive chefs everywhere and folks wanting to work in a school, school district and not, um, not be you know, standing back and thinking that, oh, if I work in school food, I'm making sandwiches. No, you're not making sandwiches. You're actually teaching children more about what is healthy, what more about wellness and agriculture and growing food and making that sofrito rather than actually buying it from a corner store or hoping that grandma is going to make it. Maybe sofrito is made in our schools, as Olivia mentioned to me the other day. So that's when I think about reimagining food um, and just elevating food to its highest level so that folks are receiving it and enjoying it and making sure that they are well as a whole. Yes, and Olivia is our food court service member uh, who works with Arlethea and excellent. We're not just serving sandwiches, come to the cafeteria. We're serving uh, great things, getting great feedback from students, student voice and choice. We're uplifting it. We're talking to parents, uh, executive chefs in all the kitchens. I'm here for it. Um, anyone else wanna, wanna take a stab at that? How can we reimagine uh, school lunch, not just reauthorize it? Yeah, I'd love to just add a point that we're, that we're to build on what our Alethea said, and in addition to the work that we're doing with a lot of our partners, and, and indeed Wellness in the Schools has chefs who are working with our Alethea's staff uh, to train them in different ways. And certainly Campbell has executive chefs and a whole team of chefs who will be working with our, um, with our students in Camden. But one thing I'd like to just build upon is that we're incorporating the student voice as well. So what, when I imagine school food, I imagine what I'd like to hear our kids are imagining because they're really, you know, it's not Campbell Soup Company telling our kids what they should be eating in Camden. It's really our kids helping us learn what 
is appropriate for them, what they want to eat, when they want to eat. So we have a student youth advisory council that advises our collective uh, on issues related to school food with our kids. Those kids will also have the opportunity to work with our North American Food Service team at Campbell. So as, as that team thinks about R&D for new products for school food, they'll be informed by the youth from Campbell. So that youth voice is essential as, as a key component in incorporating what we're doing to, to reach the outcomes that we're hoping to reach. Right, it's never, it's never too early to introduce this to students and, and get them to learn what advocacy looks like, what it, and helping them to understand that they do have a choice, right, um, in determining what they eat. So there's a second part to Dan's question, and we'll just kind of mention that. Uh, is there a way that we can streamline USDA commodities to better support schools and farmers and provide a more sustainable supply chain? We touched on this briefly earlier about, um, you know, what some of that looks like, but does uh, anyone want to want to take a, a stab at that one? Well, I'll jump in just for a quick second and um, reiterate that we had this big announcement today on some new investments uh, about the way we hope to uh, to help support our efforts on how we hope to reimagine the supply chain. And, um, you know, just say that part of what we're even last week when we uh, announced some new funding to support uh, food for emergency food banks, we talked about splitting that into two pots. One is uh, it's a billion dollars, taking about half of it and pro procuring food the way we traditionally have. And the other half, trying to think about new ways to procure the food, not just through our USD commodities, but supporting states um, so that they could buy locally, for example, to support food banks, because we have limited ability to procure locally all around the country. Um, so we want to we want to see if, if there's a way to push down some of our resources, right? Build out that capacity to buy, procure. It wouldn't just have to be for food banks, right? What we learn there can also shift over to procurement potentially for the school meal system, and then of course to to build out the um, uh, the 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 kinds of groups and the broader network so that we know that we're reaching more communities. So I guess the for us, um, we absolutely know we want to make some shifts, and I. I spent a lot of time with the head of the Agricultural Marketing Service, uh, uh, Mei Wu, and we basically, we order the food and she buys it. And so we wanna be really thoughtful about what we're ordering, right? Uh, uh, what's healthy, what's, um, what's good, what's being demand driven, but then the how we buy it, making changes there. So that will, again, that won't be to, uh, work we complete tomorrow, but we can begin tomorrow. And so that's what I hope we're on a journey towards. Right. I, I love what you mentioned there at the end. This is something we didn't get ourselves in this situation overnight. It's going to take years, decades even. But if we are all pushing forward um, mm -hmm. and recognizing what is inherent to this system and working to, to uh, you know, make disruptions where, where we can. Um, excellent. Thank you. And the next question is specifically for, for you as well, Stacey, uh, via uh, Facebook from Ann. It says, how can school communities engage on nutrition guidelines and how they work? Oh, well, okay. So this is uh, two parts. The number one answer is we can't do it without you. So don't worry, there will be a place for you. But so uh, just right now, we're in the middle of a rulemaking that started under the prior administration um, on nutrition standards. So we have to close out. Uh, and then we have to go through the updating process around updating the standards for the new um, the the dietary guidelines. And that's an opportunity for us to think longer term about uh, what standards do we want, what are and and how to go about doing them. So I just think I want to start with standards. Really have I know folks. Someone the earlier question said, "Oh, the program hasn't changed in decades." But I actually think the they have in the sense of this isn't a much healthier program that has a demonstrated impact on kids. So, and that's because of standards. So the stand, not every standard is perfect for sure. I hear that all the time, um, but it, but the standards themselves as a system have made an enormous difference. And so we've got to figure out how to move forward in a way that supports health and is again, practical and is very much informed by um, school food groups around the country. So we will absolutely create an environment to get your input. Excellent, excellent. All right, our next question is from LinkedIn uh, via Melissa, and it says, if we reimagine cafeterias as classrooms, how can we set the policy table for counting school lunch period as instructional time? So school lunch, not separate from the classroom, but an extension of. 
Um, Morgan, uh, th this is an area that that we've given uh, a lot of thought to, and, and I mentioned a few examples in my opening statement. You know, if if you imagined uh, school nutrition workers who had professional development in areas like bully prevention and cultural competency and student mentoring, let's take bully prevention as as an example. You know, we spend millions of dollars. Um, every year giving classroom teachers uh, bully prevention, professional development. But the problem is bullying doesn't take place in the classrooms. It takes place on buses, hallways, playgrounds, and cafeterias. All the purview of education support professionals, not teachers, and yet we give ESP no professional development in bully prevention. Uh, that policy should, should stop. And, and that PD should start with, with school nutrition workers. Um, cultural competency, student mentoring. Um, you know, so many of our school nutrition uh, workers end up uh, befriend, befriending and de facto mentoring uh, students. So why not give them professional development uh, uh, to do that? So yes, uh, we're, we're very much uh, down with this idea. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. Yes, I, I hear that. Thank you, Tim. Um, anyone else care to answer? Morgan, I just had a something else that I wanted to add to that. Sure. Uh, when we talk about social and emotional wellness of the student, that is something that can happen in the cafeteria. Um, one of the things that we've done with our brunch, brunch program is added in our counseling service in our school-based youth service programs in the cafeteria during our meal services, whether it was the brunch program or whether it's during lunchtime or other um, school settings times. So um, just building the bridge between the other programs and resources that are available in school can actually come into the classroom or come into the cafeteria rather and provide those additional support measures for our students during those times. So what I hear you saying is that brunch in Camden City School District is the place to be. It really is. <laughs> you, you, you know, Morgan, I, I was just gonna add that uh, adults know this, you want someone to come to something, you you're, you wanna host something, you want people to come, you give food. Ooh, that's right. You get food. So <laughs> people are already giving food. So let's take let's take that opportunity. You yep. know, um, we all know this in the research and policy mm -hmm. community. Uh, someone tells me there's lines. You're a lot more likely to show up. So um, mm -hmm. we got to we got to take advantage of that uh, as well. So our leaf is one step ahead of all of us. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Anyone else? How can we set the policy table for counting school lunch period as instructional time? All right, we'll move on to our to our next question. It's via Facebook, specifically for Alethea from uh, Maggie. It says, how about our school nutrition staff teaching students basic culinary skills during the school day and linking that to core academic classes and ultimately continuing education and job opportunities for high school youth? What do you think about that, Arlethia? What's your what's your big idea? Love and I know you. Kim wants to jump right out um, and answer this question <laughs> because we are incorporating those culinary skills in uh, the programs that we're offering through our Camden Food Collective, um, and as we partner with a uh, food food core and. Um, South Jersey Food Bank and the Croc Center, we will try to, you know, bring students to the table, teach them more about culinary skills. Um, and we have another organization that we're partnering with, with Cathedral Kitchen, that is offering those additional um, skills to students and um, to our parents and community. So we're trying to bridge those gaps. We're doing what we can. And I believe that, you know, just when we talk about nutrition education, culinary skills are, uh, with it hand in hand. So I appreciate the question. I think it's excellent. Um, Maggie, thank you for asking it because it is definitely at the top of our list of things to do to make sure that that continues um, in the Camden School District. We have a new school leader who we're partnering with that is you know, pushing the letter of the law to incorporate those culinary programs um, and create pathways for our students to, you know, grow into, even if they're going to continue on through college, they can learn a trade 
while they're in school. They can learn their, they can obtain their certifications and they can learn knife skills and be able to provide, um, you know, additional support to our school nutrition program and learn all at the same time. Thank you, Arletia. And Kim, did you have anything to add? Uh, thanks. Um, only to brag about the new Camden City High School that will be implementing not this upcoming school year, but the following school year, a track for high school students uh, for culinary and hospitality. And also that CCAP, a national organization, has just added uh, Camden to their footprint. So they will be, that's an organization of culinary arts professionals who mentor and train high school students. They will be uh, embarking in programming in Camden within the next year or two. So a, a great organization to do just what um, the questioner is suggesting is training uh, our, our high school students in, in culinary and um, professions related to culinary. Thanks. Yeah, and I think the point, thank you so much, Kim. The point is that, you know, the things that are happening in the cafeteria are not unique to the cafeteria setting, right? We can be, it's a point of education. Students are able to learn, potentially get exposure to potential careers in the future. Um, and, and why not learn from folks who are school nutrition professionals, right? Um, and sharing that exchange. Our, our next question um, comes from Facebook from uh, Laren, and it is really addressed to everyone, um, but especially under Secretary Dean. What will it take for us to finally adopt universal school meals permanently? You know, we know that universal access can increase participation, reduce cost, unlock uh, improvements in quality, but, and so we need to put pressure on Congress and, and, and Larry says, they'll do it. But what else may be missing? Wow, so that's the hard one for me. So first I just wanna say I am a product of a different era of education and took home ec almost all throughout high school. So I did learn how to cook. You know, it is something you have to do every day. So knowing how to do it and do it well is pretty and uh, pretty important skill. Um, uh, on the universal question, I think, so look, I th what the, we're, the, this administration is for what we put forward in the Families Plan, which is expanding community eligibility, which will get us to about 55% of schools in this country, and they are the highest poverty schools and highest poverty districts uh, to be able to serve universal meals uh, first. So to do more than that would, you know, require more resources, and I think would in fact uh, call upon, I guess there would need to be a uh, the broader call for it. But in my role, I don't, uh, I'm not able, uh, it's not appropriate for me to suggest that people lobby Congress or to call on it. But I, I guess the reason, so if the a family's plan moves forward, and I absolutely hope it does, because it is filled with proposals that would be, so, are just so fundamentally important investments in communities and individuals around this country. But I think the community eligibility provision, again, which would expand where we have these universal environments would be it, either, either you're someone who thinks that in and of itself is amazing and we ought to go for it, or you, you're someone who thinks this is a down payment on where I want to go with respect to universal. Um, both of those would be reasons to be uh, 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 enthusiastically embracing and speaking to it. I, I do want to flat and look those of fo those folks like Tim who are um, uh, 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 calling out Universal with extraordinary um, elegance and energy. Go f like go for it. But there are some in the community who are Universal or bust, and that it worries me a little bit because those aren't equivalent. They are not equivalent for the nine million children who would benefit from expansion of you. It is just it is just un it would be a horrible shame for high high poverty schools and communities to not get access to CEP that they don't currently have because we lay out a choice that getting halfway there isn't worth it relative to going all the way. And I, I want us to be embracing, let's let's go as far as we can. And then, because um, every step forward in supporting poor communities and poor kids is an important step forward. So that's just, sorry, that's my little soapbox, but I, I want to see us make forward progress. All right, thank you. Any Anyone else want to respond? We have about one more question. Well, I mean, I, I will just emphasize what um, Stacy said, which is that uh, people should people should support what they think is the right policy. I think there's a community building aspect, obviously, also to universal meals. And 
it, the, the, typically the only good reason I think to not support uh, compromises that help a lot of people is if the fundamental structure of the compromise is wrong. That's just not going to be the case here. The, if there, if you end up falling short of the full goal, um, you do have a you have a strong foundation to build on. Um, so uh, I, I think there's a strong case to be made uh, to uh, continue the emergency programs we've had. Um, and uh, I hope getting a, a bit to the next question, I hope that the <laughs> progress is made in the next couple of years. There's a short window, I think, in many ways, uh, at least legislatively, to um, to solidify uh, some of the gains to our social protection system, um, including the food assistance system. And uh, we have the right people in place uh, to, to do it, to do it well. Um, and you know, we live in a democracy and uh, compromise is going to be fundament fundamental to that. We'll, we'll have to see what we can get. But, uh, you know, we certainly want to, uh, I, I do hope that people lift up their the voices of the community and, and students and their families and uh, push for what they think is the right policy. And we ultimately um, support the progress we can get. Great. Thank you all. Our next question is from Miriam Nelson, uh, President and CEO of Newman's Own Foundation via LinkedIn. Do you think that, as, to, as uh, Indy alluded to, um, do you think that the next two years are that critical window uh, for major positive progress with school lunch due to this new administration, uh, Senate and House of Representatives being uh, Democratic? And, and is the two year window our, our So Morgan, you cut in and out there, but I think your question was, is the next two, is the next two year window, the window, is it, is it the window? And I think I would say, uh, I, I guess I'm not measuring um, the time space continuum that way. It's, uh, it's the moment we're in and we want to make significant change. So we're going to lean into it. Uh, we have uh, incredible partners on the Hill of, from, um, uh, on both sides of the aisle, who, you know, these programs do to traditionally have bipartisan support and we, we want to work uh, with um, leadership and uh, minority uh, leadership to, uh, to make great advances. So um, this administration is committed to making some big changes and making them now through CNR if Congress picks that up. So, uh, but I'll let others speak to uh, this next two years as, as a moment in time. Yeah, I, I will say, um, hi, Mim, thanks for joining us and join us. The time is now. The next two years are going to go by in a heartbeat. The time is now. So funder to funder, please come co-invest in all the work that we have going on because we need you, your expertise, and of course, uh, Newman's own great commitment to this work. So yes, the time is now. Thank you so much. I think I'm back. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. All right, we have one more question that we're going to try to sneak in here um, from Nor Noreen on Facebook. Um, is anyone going to mention the Food and Nutrition Education Schools Act introduced by Senators Booker and, and Cornyn? Uh, this will help scale food education programs in schools, and how do we include this issue in larger conversations around school food? Anyone, anyone want to take this? Now everyone is shy. <laughs> Listen, we can't be shy right now when we talk about school food. Um, there's no shyness um, in school food at all. And when we think about nutrition education and food, I think that we mentioned earlier, we, we weren't specific to the act or um, what was discussed by Senator Booker, Booker, but in order to scale, this will help scale food education programs in schools. We are pushing the envelope and I believe that just bridging those gaps, as I mentioned earlier, between uh, school nutrition and Department of Education is gonna be very important to change and pushing the envelope with CTE, incorporating career paths for our students because the college is not for everyone and we need to make sure that we're incorporating certification programs for students um, and parents and communities to you know just push the envelope of opportunities um, as it surrounds agriculture um, and local farming um, and urban farmers um, to better you know the whole community um, as well as the school nutrition programs. 
Thank you, Arlethea. And just for those sure. who... Who, who don't know, um, there are four marker bills that are being introduced. And one of those is the Food and Nutrition Education in Schools Act, which would create more food educator positions in public schools. So it's a huge point to have, of course, the access that National School Lunch Program provi provides, as well as other programs. But the education piece is just as important. As we say in school meals, it's not nutritional unless the food is eaten. We can't say that students are, are getting this great nutritious food if it's going in the trash. And that's where education can come into and play an essential role. Uh, food educators, what Food Corps does uh, with service members, AmeriCorps service members across the country is provide uh, the food education in schools. So uh, we're just at the end of our time and I wanna thank you all for today's discussion. The work you are each doing and the organizations you represent are important as we look for toward the future of school meals in this country. And thanks to our audience for tuning in today. If today's conversation inspired you, we urge you to write to your congressmen on the four marker bills to include in CNR that would strengthen connections between local farms, school gardens, classrooms, and the school cafeteria. Please sign up for Food Corps Policy Action Alerts to stay informed and advocate for our nation's children. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.